Good morning, everybody. So good to be with you today. It's always a privilege to be able to worship Jesus together, to exalt the name of the Lord. That's why we're here, to, to be with God, to be in his presence, to be equipped through his word, and also just to speak the truth in such a way that it will set us free in areas that we need freedom. How many of you know that all of us need some areas in our life where there may not be freedom for God to bring freedom today? Amen. Uh, I do appreciate the team, worship team, that so uh, excellently and diligently serves us each and every week um, in different venues, whether it's Sunday morning, Friday, Wednesdays, and all the times in between. So I just want to mention something real quickly in case you didn't know. A lot of times we get these questions, is there anywhere we can listen to some of these songs later on? Two of the songs that we did this morning, the one that Jasmine just sang a moment ago, Golden Streets, and then also Mountains Move, are on Every Nation's album that was released, I don't know, about a month ago now at the most, 7 verse 9. So if you haven't got a copy of 7 verse 9 yet, you can do that. I think, I thought we might have a, uh, uh, do we have it? No? Yes, we do? Okay. There's a 7 verse 9 album out there, iTunes, Spotify, all those places. You can, there it is. You can get that. Uh, Also, if you didn't know, every... Not just Every Nation's album, but In Focus Worship is about to release a worship EP. Um, And so, yeah, I'm excited about that. Uh, The song we just sang, uh, Your Love is Enough, is on that one. We have an EP worship release night on November 20th at 7 p.m. in here. That's a Wednesday night. We'd love for you to be a part. Invite somebody. It's just going to be a a family affair for all of us just to celebrate what God is doing. And if if the songs that we are writing here and we are doing here through In Focus Worship is just a blessing to this family, then praise God. I think there's a unique DNA that God does and uses songs to do that and, and to uphold and support the mission of that local church, but if God wants to use this around the world, then praise God. I'm excited about that too, but man, just a, an exciting night for us. I hope you'll be a part of that. You can listen to that starting after that date. It'll release on the 22nd, and you can listen to In Focus Worship songs wherever you listen to music, Spotify, iTunes, uh, just not on a cassette player. It won't be available there, or a CD for that matter. So uh, today, I am believing, and I have been praying And I hope you've come expecting for God to do something in your life for transformation in our lives as a result of what God is doing through this current series. In case you didn't know, we're in week five of doing this series, In My Feelings. Uh, If you're joining us for the first time today, we're excited about it, or if you're watching online later on. But here's what we're doing. We're doing the hard work of persevering and digging into our emotions with God's help as he changes us from the inside out. To do what? To help us to become emotionally healthy subsequently so we can become spiritually mature. Emotionally healthy so that we can be spiritually mature. And if this is your first time here, and you may ask, well, why does that matter? If you've been here all five weeks and you're asking, why does that matter? Then I'm going to pray for you uh, to get a revelation today. But here's the overarching idea. We've said this each and every week. Here's the reason why we're doing this. It is impossible to be both emotionally immature and spiritually mature at the same time. It's impossible to be both. We can't be emotionally immature and expect to grow in our relationship, be spiritually mature in Christ. It doesn't work that way. Now, this is presupposing, I'm just going to go out on a limb, but this is presupposing that we want to be spiritually mature. That we want to grow in our love for God, our love for one another, that we want to fulfill the purpose God has for our life, that we want to walk in the freedom that Christ died for us to walk in. And if that's you and that's your heart's desire, or if that's what you're looking into or hoping or believing is the answer to the questions you have in this life, then Christ is the one who has the answer. And it's finding our fullness and our wholeness and our healing in Him alone, completely. Our emotions, our mind, our spiritual being, all of us wholly given to God. We can't just give part of ourselves to God and expect to be whole individuals. So we want to be whole people so we can wholly love God and wholly love people. It's hard to love God with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength if I haven't given myself over for God to move in every area of my life, including my emotions, which is what we're, what we're typically and specifically talking about throughout this series. And in order for that to happen, just like everything else in this life, when it comes to being a Christ follower, we have to submit ourselves to God. We have to submit our lives to Christ, persevere through difficulty, wait at the walls of struggle that we will encounter in this life, and then allow God God to do his work in us and through us. 
It's what James 1, 2 through 4 says. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Not lacking anything means whole. Not lacking anything means wholly given to God, wholly healed and, and set free and walking in the fullness that God has for you. We want to be whole people so we can wholeheartedly love God and wholeheartedly love one another. That's the greatest commandment. And in order for that to happen, we have to submit our lives to God. And that's what we're doing. And I believe this. I believe as we submit our lives to God, and we've been doing that now over the last four weeks in this particular area of emotional health, as we submit our lives to God, God is going to do something special and unique in us. I believe he's already doing something unique at In Focus Church right now. If you've been a part of this, maybe you've sensed it. Maybe you've felt it. It's not, it's not one of these things where we're just like going, yes, go God. It's, it's more like we said last week. It's like, ouch. Oh, okay, but God, I know you're doing something in this, and, and it's something that I need to look into and allow you to delve into in my life. I believe we're experiencing, actually, a move of God. Maybe it's not like any move that you've experienced before or nothing that I've experienced before necessarily here at In Focus Church. I can't fully explain all that it is, but I want you to know God wants to have his way in us. Really, that's all that's required as it comes to our emotions. For God to have his way in us is for us to say, Lord, have your way in me. Not my will, but your will be done. If we will submit to God that way as it relates particularly today with our emotions, then he is going to work in our lives. He's going to do something where he transforms us to look more like his son. And after last week, we were talking about the wall if you were here. Maybe you will uh, take the time, if you weren't, to go back and listen to that series or that particular message in this series about the walls, and we're talking about the difficulties of life, because I believe God wants to do something through the walls that we're all going to encounter in this life. As a matter of fact, I, I ran into somebody, not literally, but I was at the gas station, and it was late in the evening, and I was filling up the car with gas, and this, which is what you do at a gas station, and, uh, and this lady just stopped me, and she was behind me, and I could tell, you know, when somebody looks at you, and they recognize you, but, but you don't recognize them. Like, I know, I feel like she's looking at me like she knows me, but I don't know her. And so she just said, hey, are you the pastor at In Focus Church? And I said, well, as a matter of fact, Diane, did you notice my magnet on the back of my car? She's like, no, I just recognized you while you were there pumping the gas. I was like, oh, okay. Well, anyway, and so she said, I don't go to your church, but I have been listening to these messages online, and I just have to tell you how amazing it has been for me as God has begun to do a work in my heart and life. So I want you to know that this goes beyond even these four walls today, and if you're listening later on to this video, and whether you go here or not, we're praying that God would do this work in you as you submit your life to him as well. But if you are here with us or you're watching or you've been a part of this and you come to the wall and it was a difficult message, I, I agree with that. I concur. But you go, well, how much lower can, you, can we go? I mean, how much further down can we take ourselves, so to speak? How much lowliness can we walk in? And I'll say it's like spiritual limbo. I don't, I don't know, but I know we can go lower. So let's lower the bar and let's say, how low can you go, Right? Because God, and I'm not talking about low in a bad way, I'm talking about lowliness of heart, which the scripture talks about. I'm talking about humility, which the scripture talks about. I'm talking about following in the footsteps of our Savior, who is called the humble king, who didn't come to be served, but to serve. I'm talking about a place where our pride is wiped away from us, and all that's left as we're stripped bare before a loving God is to say, God, have your way with me. I've gone as low as I feel like I can go, and there is the heavenly Father there to lift you you up can I go lower sure to greater depths of humility for God takes out every vestige of pride that might still be in me spiritually speaking how you really feel and being honest with God is imperative to your spiritual growth listen it is a spiritual disaster to live in unreality particularly when it comes to loss and grief and pain and that's what we're talking about today as it relates to our emotions the title of this morning's message is, That's How You Feel. Have you ever had somebody look at you and you tell them how you feel and their response is, well, that's stupid. If you haven't, then you're probably not married or you're probably not living on the planet Earth, right? Everybody has had, not that Carla's ever said that to me, I've probably said that to her, right? Oh, that's dumb. You shouldn't feel that way. And the reality for all of us is, is no matter what you might think about what somebody 
feels, it doesn't change the fact that that is what they are feeling. And so this is what I want to talk about today. How are you feeling? And we want to be honest before God as he does something inside of us because it's imperative to your spiritual growth that you would be honest before God about how you really feel. As many of you know, I'm a huge sports fan, and since I'm from Georgia, I have experienced a lot of painful losses over my lifetime. Um, not yesterday, though. <laughs> um, just, just a side note for the second service. So I did that. But I also have some other teams that I root for that aren't from Georgia, and all of them have had losses. As any sports fan, you're going to have a lot of losses. But as it relates to Georgia sports, and I've been an Atlanta Braves fan since the 70s when I listened to them on the radio going to bed because it put you to sleep because they were terrible, right? And, I, and I've been a, a Georgia fan since I can remember, and I've been a, a Falcons fan, and, and all of these things, right? None, none. No losses were more painful than the loss of Super Bowl 51. This Super Bowl owns the record for the largest comeback in Super Bowl history by a long shot. Like the largest deficit ever come back from in Super Bowl before was 10 points. I didn't even know that. I was like, wow. So, for those of us who are Falcons fans, with six minutes to go in the third quarter, with the largest comeback in Super Bowl history prior to this being 10 points, we had a 25-point lead. With nine minutes to go in the entirety of the game, Atlanta had the ball and a 16-point lead, and the ESPN's win probability machine gave them a 99.6 chance of winning that game. Did you know that losing a game after having a 99.6 probability of winning a game is like losing eight consecutive coin flips? Go home and try it. See how long you sit there trying to lose. Eight consecutive coin flips. And one of those coin flips was a coin flip literally for the ball, meaning that the Atlanta Falcons offense would never touch the ball in overtime and eventually lose to the New England Patriots in the greatest comeback in Super Bowl history. And it was painful for anybody that was a Falcons fan. I'm sure it was painful for those that played on the team. And they went through this loss. You don't just move on from something like that. And this is just sports. The next season at training camp, this is what happened. The team used a military slang mantra. And some of you, we have a lot of military in this, in this room, in this spiritual family, so you probably know what I'm talking about. They used the military slang mantra for their training camp in the year. And my apologies to my mother and anybody in that generation, but it doesn't mean that much to us in this generation. But their mantra was, embrace the suck. That was their mantra. Most people don't know that they actually use that as their slogan for the Super Bowl year, not in a response to them losing the Super Bowl, although, although it was a great reason to use it. And it was just one of these things. And that whole slang, embrace the pain, embrace the, the terribleness of the situation, basically just means this. It means that we would say this is something that is extremely unpleasant, but I am going to consciously accept it because it is unavoidable. But here's what has happened in the church. The reason I say this, we don't like to embrace difficulty. We don't like to embrace pain. So in the church, we don't embrace that, right? We have a different mantra in the church. It's run from reality and put on a happy face. Run from reality and just tell everybody you're, you're too blessed to be stressed. Right, and come up with all these pithy things that we can say that really just don't ring true in our own hearts or in the hearts of other people that are looking for some reality. Because we spend our whole lives running and we're so tired emotionally, physically, and spiritually because we're running as hard as we can from reality, putting on this false facade as if everything is okay. But what the gospel teaches is the exact opposite of that. It says that actually true spiritual life is not an escape from reality, but an absolute commitment to it. This is what it's like. This is what the facts are. This is what's really going on. This is how I feel but God, I'm giving it to you. So you can't give to God what you're not admitting is there. The reality is we're human, 
and we have human limitations. And our limitations in this life are behind everything that we go through that involves loss and pain and sorrow and grief. These are the facts of life. And how we respond to those realities of pain and suffering and difficulty and death that we go through affect if we're going to be emotionally healthy and therefore spiritually mature or if we're going to stay emotional infants and therefore stay spiritual infants, which the Bible references quite often. Romans 4, 19, you don't have to turn there, but I want you to watch. Actually, yes, let's go ahead and turn there if you have your Bible with you today. Romans 4, chapter, chapter 4, verse 19. I've got my little red thing there just to help me mark it. This Bible's really cool. It's got three of them, a brown one, a black one, and a red one. So, just so you know, I know you don't care, but it's something I just wanted to share. <laughs> what we're going to watch right here is Abraham is confronted with his own limitations, And instead of running from them, instead of denying them, instead of going, listen, hey, Sarah, I am too blessed to be stressed. There's so much favor on my life right now, I don't know what to do. Instead of that, instead of denying the reality, he responds differently. Verse 19, without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. Since he was about 100 years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God. See, this is the good thing. We're not not wavering at this point. We're just saying this is what's going on, but what I'm not going to waver on is the goodness and the promises of God. But he was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. See, that's where we're persuaded at the wall. That's where we're persuaded as we go down into the depths of humility or we're dealing with grief and loss and pain and death in this life, that God has the power to do. Our painful realities in this life do not weaken the power of God to work in our lives doesn't mean we're not going to go through painful realities. It just means that God's power is not weakened because of our limitations and our loss and our deaths and our griefs that we go through here. We don't have to ignore from them or run from them and the reality of that pain or loss. We can embrace them. Why? Why do we need to embrace them? Because the scripture says that God is your ever-present help in time of trouble. It's admitting that I'm in trouble. It's admitting that this is difficult. That's where God is. It's in the place where the dark gets darker, that the light gets lighter. When I feel like there's no much, no further that I could go into the depths of this cavern, it's the light of God that shines even brighter. It's in the face of pain that joy is that much more great. It's in the pain of difficulty that the joy of God's faithfulness is made that much clearer. It's in these moments that we see God. It's not in my strength that I'm strong. It's in my weakness where I've got nowhere to go and nothing I can do to change this that you are made strong in me. This is reality. This is being honest before God where God sovereignly chooses our limitations to change us. And then sometimes he breaks through them because he's not bound by our earthly limitations either. I am, not God. But what he chooses to do and how he chooses to do it is his sovereign choice. How long, as we said last week, do we stay at the wall? Is his sovereign choice. Faith does not close its eyes to reality. That's what we see in Abraham's response. And neither is it limited by the best human estimates of what is possible. Well, I think we could do this, and I think we could do that. I'm not sure if we could do this. God's not limited by your best estimate of what is possible. He could do the impossible. That's why in verse 17 of Romans 4, it says that he's the one that brings life out of death. But what it does not do Faith does not overlook the facts. It recognizes that what is dead is dead and knows that God is the only one that can give life where there is no life. Abraham believed that what God had said, despite Abraham's physical limitations, that God was able. His hope was not in his invincible, indomitable human strength or spirit. No, his hope was in a God who was a covenant keeper, who was a promise keeper, who was faithful even when Abraham was faithless. His her power came from the fact that he trusted in the power of God to do what only God could do in his life. But what happens when God wants to do a deeper work through your loss, through your grief, through your pain? Listen to me right now. No matter how much faith you have in this life, you're going to have loss, pain, and death because they're inevitable in this life. We all experience many deaths, M-A-N-Y, And I say we experience many, many deaths, M-I-N-I, deaths in this life that we go through, losses, 
painful things in this lifetime. And how we handle them, this is why this is so important, how we handle them determines whether we're going to be emotionally healthy and let God have his way in us and take us to some places of emotional depth and healing and spiritual maturity that we will have never gone otherwise to make sure there's a purpose for the pain in this life. And God's the only one that really does that. Listen, if we, if we respond the way God's word tells us to, then God is going to have his way in us. But we can also make the choice to run from reality and live in a fantasy world and be comfortably numb pretending everything is all good anybody ever have that maybe that's your phrase you ever have somebody you tell something and their response to you all the time well, it's all good it's all good really it's all good no it's not it's not all good the only thing that is all good is God himself. So you can say, well, God is good, that's true, but this isn't good. And that's where we find ourselves emotionally honest. This is not good, I'm gonna embrace this junk right now because I know God is good and he's here with me in the middle of this not good situation and whatever he wants to do in me, I want him to do it. That's good. Maybe the situation is not. And yet God wants to do something in our lives. So let's talk about the things that we lose in this life, the little deaths that we die, so we can all be aware of the fact that we are dealing with some things that maybe you've never actually dealt with, that you're kind of running from. We lose our youthfulness. Anybody losing their youthfulness? They're all, okay, everybody's hand ought to go up because you are, whether you realize it or not. You're losing your youthfulness. We lose some of our dreams. Maybe concerning a marriage, a career, or children that we'd hoped to have. Many of us will experience catastrophic loss where a family member dies too early, too soon, tragically. A child or a loved one commits suicide. A spouse has an affair or leaves unexpectedly. We get a terminal illness. We have a child with severe disabilities. We have a loyal friend that betrays us miscarriages, infertility, dementia, abuse, and on and on and on. Hey, but did you hear about the new Netflix show that we could binge watch this week? Hey, what about that new Apple watch? Are you going to get that too? Yet, yeah, no, I actually am going to get the phone and the watch and the new Apple shoes that they're coming out with. I didn't even know about those. <laughs> and you see what our culture is so good at is it running from reality by numbing the pain through every kind of addiction that we can come up with. We're going to binge watch some shows. We're going to stay incessantly busy. We're going to work 75 hours a week. Pornography, overeating, over shopping, over drinking, or taking a plethora of a pharmacy full of pain pills, or whatever the case may be. Anything and everything that we can do to help us avoid and numb the pain that God actually has brought us to so that he could do a deeper work in us. Grieving loss, expressing our emotions of sadness, hurt or pain actually for us in this world becomes a problem that we avoid it's like a battle that we fight against it's an invasion that we're not gonna have. nope not invading my life it's something that we avoid and we fight against but the result of denying running from or minimizing our pain and our loss and not grieving things that we should grieve over many years results in dry empty christians that have denied their limitations of our own humanity actually become less human become more robotic have created a false version of ourselves with a plastic facade over our smiling faces, not allowing God to help us to become our true self, which is the pathway of the pain and the loss and the grieving with our Savior. Some of us need to actually cry and grieve over some losses we've experienced or some deaths that we've encountered in our lives. One of our small group leaders was sharing with me this week about someone in their group that said they were, had cried as a result of going through this and working through the, the wall last week for the first time in years. And I actually believe that God wants to do that in this. That's part of what God wants to do for us and in us. And like, oh man, I don't cry and stuff and emotions. Eh, there's the problem. God made you with these emotions. And there are things in this life because we're human that we should grieve over. Like that's where somebody would come, are you even human? Much, much, not much less, are you a Christian human? Are you just human or are you just a robot that you wouldn't grieve this loss? And I'm not talking about, as First Thessalonians says, I'm not talking about if you're a Christian here, grieving as those who have no hope. I'm just talking about grieving as those that do have hope. 
But there's still grief over loss and pain and difficulty and death and things that are not the way they should be. And so maybe some of us today or sometime this week while you're by yourself and God brings something to your mind, you just need to have one of them just straight up ugly cries. You know what I'm talking about? Like where the snot's pouring out your nose, you can't do anything about it, right? Tears coming down, you're like... It's like, what is... I mean, I've had those for a while in, in different times of my life. I remember one in particular, I've shared it probably here before, and I was at Toy Story 3. <laughs> yeah, you think you got problems. <laughs> but I was there with my sons, my two oldest sons at the time, and Caleb was 10 at the time, and Josiah was about to turn 9, because it came out in June of that year. So 10 and 8, and they're, I'm sitting in between the two of them. They were such cute little things. You know, I'm sitting there, and we're watching this movie, and that movie is bad. Because then Andy goes off to college. <laughs> I look over this Caleb. There's Josiah. And they're like, Dad? Are you okay? I'm good. I haven't even seen Toy Story 4. I don't want to. I thought, I asked somebody, they're like, oh, no, it's just as bad. I'm like, no, not doing it. I'm not, I'm not emotionally healthy enough to watch it at this point. <laughs> so what I should have said, Dad, are you okay? Well, Ecclesiastes <laughs> says that for everything there's a season, son. <laughs> but it's true, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. Somehow in this life, we've cut out a few of those and said, now it's just time to dance and laugh. Don't have time for weeping and mourning. Look, I understand that turning towards painful realities is counterintuitive. We've been taught our whole lives to figure out a way to defend against it. And for kids, especially those of you who grew up in some difficult situations, it's normal. It's normal to actually create some defense mechanisms so that you can have some normalcy in life when the things around you are not normal at all when your parents aren't doing the right things and when somebody does something they shouldn't do and so all of a sudden just so that you can have a normal childhood you begin to create some emotionally unhealthy defense systems if you will and that's okay as a child but if you take them into adulthood and start to relate to your life that way then you stay an emotional infant and you don't allow God to do the finished work that he wants to do in your life and we know that the gospel says this because we figured out how to cope with difficult things but Luke 9, we said this last week, Jesus himself said, and he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Listen to me, the pathway to resurrection and everyone who gives their life to Christ now shares in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but the pathway to resurrection is through the crucifixion. The pathway to life is through death, and there's a resurrection that only can occur when we go through the pain of the crucifixion, and I know it's a lot easier to teach, and it's a lot easier to preach than it is to do. I know, I know, I know from experience, but it's time that we let down our defenses and we allow God to have his way in our lives, our pasts, our emotions, that we come out of that turtle shell, you will, if you will, of, of our protection and our defenses that we've been putting up since our childhood. We go wherever God leads us, and we don't defend ourselves against the good work that a good, loving father wants to do inside of us, even if it's at the wall of pain and suffering and grieving loss. Pete Scazzaro, in his book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, which we're using in our small groups here, and you could get it at our resource center, talks about the defense mechanisms. And I'm just going to briefly go through a few of them and see if there's any that you actually use. I would tend to say that we all use almost all of them, and some of them are our favorites, but all of us use one or two of them for sure. So that we can avoid God's purpose for pain, we actually go and use these defense mechanisms. But I want to take, it, take this off and shine light onto them so we can allow God to do his work in us. First of all, there's denial. Well, this isn't really happening. That's that unreality that I'm talking about. No, everything's good. It's all good, all good, all good. Minimizing. Well, it's not that big of a deal. Blaming others. Well, it's their fault. I'm not taking any responsibility for this. Or blaming yourself. Well, this is all my fault rationalizing, intellectualizing, distracting. We're really good at distracting. 
and then becoming hostile and angry. See, he also goes on to give five different phases of biblical grieving, and we're not going to go into those. I'd encourage you to read them and, and walk through them because they're imperative to our ability to honestly follow Jesus. We spent some time talking about being emotionally aware. So what? So we can know what to give to God. We can know what to surrender to God because it's hard to be living in surrender if we don't even know what to surrender. When it comes to grief and loss, this is what C.S. Lewis says, we are bringing to God what is in us, not what ought to be in us. Bring to God what is actually in you, not what you think should be in you. I mean, I've been as guilty as anybody else of this. Like, well, I should feel this way, so that's what I'm going to talk about. God, I know I should feel this way. And God's kind of said, well, what do you really feel? How do you feel? Well, I, I mean, I feel angry, but I know I'm not supposed to. Yeah. No, I want to know what you really feel because what is, the Bible says that the truth sets us free. So how in the world are we going to be set free from what we're feeling if we're not truthful about what we're feeling? The truth sets us free. Jesus is the truth. So I go to the cross. I go to my Savior and I say, this is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm dealing with. This is what's bothering me. This is what's painful. This is what's difficult. This is what I'm grieving. This is what I want to weep about. God, this is what's going on with me right now. And it's at that place that our Savior meets us because he's already been there. He's waiting for us to meet him there. Let me focus on one phase of our biblical grieving. I've already mentioned this and I'll say it again and then we'll land this plane, but it's the gift of limits. Did you know that you all have limits in your life? This whole idea that you can do anything and everything is a bunch of crap. <laughs> I mean, did he just say crap? I've, well, I've said two words already today. So the reality is you cannot do anything and everything. You can't do it all. And we have to be accepting of the limits that we have in this life that God has placed there so that we understand that he's the only one that can do it all. We're dependent upon him. Here's some limitations that you have. Your physical body is a limit. Some of us more than others, right? Our physical body is a limit. You're dying. You're one day closer to death today than you were yesterday. Man, this is so encouraging. I can't wait to come back to church next week. But it's true, and we live as if we have an inordinate amount of time, and yet we have a limitation. There's only so much time that God has given us, and we don't even know how much time that is. You are going to leave this world with some unfinished goals and unfinished dreams. It's a limitation, and maybe you need to grieve that. Your family of origin is a limitation. Your culture the makeup of your family, all of that play a role in your certain limits that you have in this life. Being married brings limits. Didn't hear any amens. I was just pausing for that. Being single brings limits. Having children brings limits. Having lots of children brings lots of limits. Your intellectual capacity creates limits. Your wealth or lack thereof brings limits. I don't care if you're Bill Gates. It doesn't matter. There's even a limit to the most richest man in the world. There's a limitation. Your time is limited each day, each week, throughout your life. Our work gives us limits. Our relationships give us limits because none of them are ever going to be perfect this side of heaven. And then even our comprehension of spiritual things is limited. Yes, we can know God through his word, but the Bible also says that he, his thoughts are unsearchable. He's not just imminent, but he's also transcendent. We can't know all there is to know about him. We'll spend all of eternity seeing more things about our amazing God. And when we embrace, why do we say this? When we embrace our limits, when we grieve and even mourn over some of these limits and others, when necessary, it allows us to become closer to the one that we need to depend on who has no limitations, and that's our God. Limits tell me the world's going to go on and survive without me, and it reminds me at the same time that I cannot survive without God. Embracing my limitations causes me to experience a greater desperation for God. Personally, for me, depression was a gift. It was a gift of God to me. It was a limit that God placed on me. He said, you cannot go any further living this way and ignoring these things because I want to do something in you, but this is a limit. You can't do it without me. But here's the cool thing about it. It was a gift from God to help me heal, to help me mourn my limitations, but I also was able to accept that although I have limitations, and I accept that God is able to work through me despite my limitations. See, that's the place that we can all come to today. 
You all have limitations, but God is able because he is not bound by our limitations to work through them and even beyond them because he's God and we're not. It was a gift from God to help me. And maybe you have some gifts that God has given you that you're trying not to open. See, age is another limit that I've had to grieve at times. I can't do everything. I'm not as young as I used to be. I don't look like I used to look. There's lines and wrinkles in places that I didn't think you could get them. And the reality is, I want to do everything that God wants me to do, but I don't want to do more than God has asked me to do. There's a limitation to what is in my life. I am not, you are not the center of the universe. God is. Limits humble us and humility embraces limits. That's what we're saying today. That's an honest, healthy acceptance before God. Here's what 2 Corinthians says about this. And I don't think there's any other scripture that encapsulates and summarizes the idea of grieving loss and pain and the need to trust God through all of that, all the many deaths that we go through in this life than this. Verse 7, but we have this treasure in jars of clay. Guess what? You're not a jar of steel. To show that the surpassing power belongs to who? To God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. Did you know that you cannot manifest the life of Jesus in your body until you've accepted the death of Christ in your body? For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. The world around us is waiting for us to embrace the way of the cross so that they know that they can embrace the way of the cross, that there are real difficulties, real pain, real struggle in this life that God is with us in the middle of. When we walk in a manner that's honest before God, properly dealing with loss, pain, and sadness, anger, and grief, we enter into a deeper relationship with God where we trust him more and more. That's the purpose of our pain. As a matter of fact, the central message of Christ is that suffering and death bring resurrection and transformation. We just have to be willing to go down the road of the cross. Joni Erickson, tada, who was paralyzed from the neck down for over 30 years after a diving accident. She wasn't born that way. Dove off a dock and broke her neck. She said she's experienced both the death of Jesus and the life of Jesus. Here's a quote. The cross is the center of our relationship with Jesus. The cross is where we die. We go there daily and it isn't easy. Normally we will follow Christ anywhere to a party where he changes the water into wine, to a sunlit beach where he preaches from the boat, but to a cross, we dig in our heels. The invitation is so frighteningly individual, it's an invitation to go alone. But it's when we're willing to go to the cross that we allow God who is with us always and we're never alone in that way to root out all the things in us that are not of God. And it's the place where he begins to put in us the things that are, where the old gives birth to new. It's what John says, that unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground in earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Just like Jesus was the first, now we die to ourselves and a lot of fruit comes out of that. Allow God, here's what I want you to do. I want you to allow God to bless you through your losses by going with him through the pain and grieving of what you have lost that a road closed sign that you keep trying to circumnavigate might actually be a road closed so God can redirect your life into something new that he's trying to do. So that maybe today that you and I can pray together, Father, forgive me for trying to avoid the little deaths that have been brought to my life because you're trying to do something new out of it because the only way for the new to come is for the old to die. Deal honestly and prayerfully with your losses, your disappointments, and all the emotions that come with that. Jesus himself wept over Jerusalem because in Luke it says that they didn't recognize that he was a savior. And it says that he looked out over the city and he wept. And the Greek word for weep there is that he wailed and he sobbed. The Son of God wailed and sobbed. He cried aloud. What are you feeling this morning? That's how you feel. Take it to Jesus. Don't run from the reality, run into Jesus. Hebrews 5, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. 
although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. For those of you who are sons and daughters of God, God is doing a deeper work in you through your loss and the pain, the things that you may be suffering through right now. But remember, resurrection only comes out of death. Real death. Our losses and your pain, they're real. That's how you feel. But our living God is just as real. And he's going to bring life out of the situation. Let resurrection and transformation come out of your pain and loss today. Take it to the cross. And as we grieve what needs to be grieved, then we can receive what God wants you to receive. And that is his love and his power and his greater purpose for your life. That's what he wants to do. Let's go ahead and bow our heads right now. We're going to pray, sing, and we're going to go. But I'm going to ask that you not walk out of here just yet until God does what he wants to do in you and through you. Say, well, what am I dealing with today? I don't know, but you do and God does. There's some things that you need to grieve today. And if it means that maybe you cry for the first time ever, then so be it. If it's not here, maybe it's later on this week and God reminds you and you have a, a moment with God where you actually grieve something you need to grieve. A loss. A death something that you've been trying to keep alive and you've put on life support and yet God's saying just like he did to Abraham just like he did with his own son let it die so I can do something even more powerful a resurrection lay it down grieve the loss grieve the finality of the loss and as you do yeah maybe a tear starts to fall Maybe that ugly cry I talked about a moment ago starts to hit you. And I would say, listen, don't fight it today. And we've got people that are willing to help and pray for you. Even after the service, you can meet some prayer teams at our prayer rooms down front on the outside of these doors over here to my left and right. But let God do his work in you. Let God do his work in you. Let's build our life on the foundation of God's love today. Let's stand to our feet, church.